So thank you. Hey everyone, my guest today is Kevin Cahoon. Kevin's Broadway credits include The Who's Tommy, The Lion King, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Rocky Horror Picture Show, The Wedding Singer, and currently Shucked. Shucked. Off Broadway. <laughs> Shucked. Um, <laughs> some of his off Broadway credits include Hedwig and the Angry Inch, The Foreigner, The Wild Party, How I Learned to Drive, and many, many more. Some of his TV and film credits include. Monarch Glow, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, A Series of Unfortunate Events, Nurse Jackie, Modern Family, Good Wife, NCIS, Curse of the Jade Scorpion, One Night, many, many others. Go to Google. You'll find it all. I am so honored and thrilled to have the extraordinary Kevin Cahoon on the podcast. Um, good morning on a Monday. Good morning. The honor is all mine. Truly. Truly. Well, when we first met. Tell during, me, well, was it through Kristen? Yes, it was okay. during Charlie Brown, through Kristen and Stanley, Wayne Mathis, and that was it. And I've just been such an admirer and fan of yours for all of these years, and I'm so happy to be here, truly. Well, I think if I recall, and you're going to have to tell me if this is, I feel like you had done Babes in Arms with Kristen. That's right. Um, at the and Guthrie. You did, at the Guthrie. You did a little show. I'm so sad nothing came of it called The Lion King with That's Stanley, right. <laughs> with Stanley Wayne Mathis. I could only have run. I know. There was so much potential. Do you know what it I mean? Really like, yeah. I thought like Julie Taymor seemed smart and right. creative, Very but smart. I don't the know. songs were catchy. They were catchy you know. puppets. Why not? Families, you know. I mean, but if that could Kevin, only have taken off, it would have really become something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 25 years later, there might have been a celebration of some kind. Well, I'll tell you, when we did the out of town in Minneapolis at the Orpheum, we did it to half full houses. They that didn't understand. Week, they didn't, they didn't know, know what it was. And Tom Schumacher, who was, um, you know, the producer and head of Disney theatricals, had a cast meeting and said, they don't know. They think it could be an ice show. They think it could be a this or a that. But, you know, once we did the first four or five performances, it was, you know, through the roof. But, you know, you never know from somewhere, right? I know. I just had Julie on another podcast I do. It's And, and the award goes to is, is a, a podcast that focuses on Tony winners. And it's like she was in the room yesterday for the first time. Like all of the memory she has of the creating of that show, by the way, all over the world. I, I don't even know how many companies there oh. are. It's yeah. like she has this photographic memory of every moment that led to what we now know as the global sensation that Kevin Cahoon was in the original company of The Lion King. Let's talk about that because, because yes, you just did eight shows this week of a new Broadway show called Shucked, but I yeah. truly believe that Shuck doesn't happen without us going back to what I read as part of your childhood was being a rodeo clown. So yeah. let us go back and then we will make our way uh, sure. on this journey to today okay. um texas texas absolutely um my parents met in the rodeo club as their elective in high school in houston and my dad was a calf roper and they fell in love and rodeo was always a big part of um our family and i fell in love with rodeo clowns and i knew that that was something I wanted to do. How can I do it? And my parents and grandparents said, let's make this happen. So I started doing these acts in between events that were comedic acts. And I had a trick pony and I had a dog and I had a monkey and we created these comedic acts. And, you know, we did the rodeos in Texas and Oklahoma. We'd load up the horse trailer every weekend and off we went and then my grandfather had this great idea let's call him the world's youngest rodeo clown so there were like keychains and on the side of the horse trailer was the name and it was um magical and formative it was the first time I was standing on a stage it was an arena but it was in front of hundreds and I all you know at the Astrodome which was the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo how many people did the Astrodome hold giant stadium and somehow I had the confidence to go out in the middle of that stadium and do these comedic acts. And so it was my first connection with an audience, first connection with making a joke land in front of an audience. 
And there's something about the um, the majesty of it, the spectacle of it that really connected to me. And I love the circus. I was obsessed with the circus. So then my mom had the wonderful idea. Let's sign him up for a drama class at the Houston Museum of Fine Arts in the summer and see what happens. And then, I mean, there was no turning back. I did do rodeos through my, till my sophomore year of high school. Um, but that's when I started doing theater under the stars in Houston. And um, it was incredible. I fell in love with the theater and I fell in love with musicals and I just became obsessed. And I was rodeoing and doing theater at the same time, which I don't think is a common thing. And then, you know, no. I, you know. <laughs> no, but also I think there's a misconception you know, if if you live on like the East Coast or the West Coast, I think there's a misconception and you have just debunked this myth mm -hmm. that if you are a person interested in rodeo, your other passion might be monsters trucks versus musical theater, right? But the idea that your mom had this understanding that both worlds could exist mm -hmm. as a passion for someone um, mm -hmm. really shines a light on ideas and misconceptions people might have about a very myopic focus in life, about what one can and can't do. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people from Texas on this podcast. I've had John Benjamin Hickey. I've had Michael Urie. Um, love them all. Love them all. Love them all. Julie White. <laughs> like so many. I mean, Texas love. is a breeding ground for extraordinary talent. Um, talk to me about First of all, when you say landing jokes as a rodeo clown, like I pictured a lot of like, I don't know, Bill Irwin and and sort of nonverbal uh, clowns don't often speak. So right. tell yeah. me about like, can you remember and then it'll just directly shoot to Shuck where it's one liner after one liner after one right. liner by Sir Robert Horn. Yes. Um, tell me, like, do you remember any of the jokes that you told and how old are you when you are rodeo clowning? I st five to 15. Okay. That teeny the... tiny. Started yeah, teeny tiny. tiny. Little, little, little. Oh my God. And there was, there was a, there an, there's an announcer at a rodeo. So we would have scenes that were pre-written that the announcer and I would go back and forth. I didn't have a mic on. So I'm sort of telling, and he would pick up, oh, you're saying that back and forth, back and forth. Okay. So there is that, that was the first scenes I ever did was with an announcer at a rodeo. Um, and then there were also comedic acts like there was sort of a, you know, there were, a lot of animals were involved in the acts. Sure. Um, Absolutely. And my monkey would ride the dog and run the barrels, which are in the cloverleaf pattern. Right. Um, there was like a shootout where I would shoot this clown with these pistols and then he would have water that would squirt out of his coat. And then I would like, oh, I've succeeded. And I go to exit and then he shoots me and there's like a, a bomb in my pants, like a powder bomb. That's sort of the kind of, and they were all, you know, three minutes, like nothing okay. longer because okay. it's just to set up for the next event. It's a dying art form because now they just show commercials on the big screen. Right, right, right. Um, but it really was, it was just the most, for, I'm actually wearing my dad's um, belt buckle, his calf roping buckle from 1968 tomorrow night to the opening. It's just taking a little part of it. Wow, wow, how beautiful, yeah. how beautiful. Mm -hmm. Is your dad no longer with us? No longer with us, um, but um, you know, I, I do, I feel him tremendously at shocked mm -hmm. because it's the world that I am from and started in and yeah, you know, my both of my parents spectacular and both sets of grandparents just did everything they could to encourage this unique only child and like, let him fly and you know which is just a testament to them truly yeah it's incredible yeah, yeah. i yeah. mean i also read that you won junior star search i did so can we of, of yes. course you did of course okay. you did I don't know. so it's so, so how did tell me about like how does that happen yes okay so i'm 13 and i'm in houston and i had an agent and i would do local tv commercials in houston and the agent said to me, Star Search, which was at the time, like the Sam Harris had just had his giant debut season. It was the next season. They decided to do a junior 
show, my agent said, do you want to sing some song? No, she said to me, do you want to be in the acting division on Star Search? I can get you an audition. And I said, no, I don't think the acting division is right for me. I would like to sing. And she said, okay. So I sang <laughs> for the audition. Next thing you know, I got it. And my mom and I were off to LA and I, I won it. I was the grand champion of Star Search and singing show tunes, which everyone thought, oh, well, this will never happen because they're going to be singing Journey and Cindy Lauper and Michael Jackson and pop songs. But I knew that I wanted to sing some people from Gym C. <laughs> so who knew? And that's it was the season with Sinbad and Rosie O'Donnell. And that summer we did a show called The Stars of Star Search, which sort of did the Catskills um, uh, you know, tour, whatever that's called. And that was fun and incredible. And, you know, then I went back to Houston and went to high school. <laughs> so how did you get to New York City? Well, I got a manager, Edie Robb, uh, Station 3, still my manager to this day, as a matter of fact. Um, she's brilliant and wonderful, and they're like family to me. And she saw Star Search, and I, I signed with her, and then I, that's what got me to New York City. And I was here, I would fly back and forth sometimes for auditions and live here in the summer. And then I went to NYU when I was 17 and studied acting at Tisch, at Circle on the Square, which... I learned so much about myself and this and life. And I think going to college in New York is such an incredible thing to do if you can, because you're introduced. I, I went to acting school at Circle in the Square with Roper cowboy boots and Wrangler jeans on. So, and what was the reception? I mean, they all, I mean, we were all friends. We just loved each other. And, you yeah. know, there's nothing like an acting class with, people for two or three years to sort of really connect you in a way. And are you living in a dorm? Uh-huh. Okay. Ruben Hall at NYU for the first two years. And my roommate was Sean Baker, who is legendary filmmaker of Tangerine and the Florida Project and all of those incredible films. We were roommates. Wow. Um, Sarah Silverman was down the hall. You know, it was just awesome and I was just you know I loved musicals and I was wearing cowboy boots I just... know I know but like there you were you were being yeah. completely your authentic self and embraced and in New York in those yeah. cowboy boots New York City I know I know I know I know was it um I mean it sounds like you'd been back and forth a little bit to audition yeah. I'm sure you saw do you remember the first Broadway show that you saw Cats yes Absolutely. Perfect. That was the first show. And of course I was obsessed with it and loved it. And, and then I ended up after college, that was like a year and I was selling merch at cats and at those that I had that job. That's what I did. And that's where I met Jesse Tyler Ferguson for the first time. Who was one of my best friends who was a bartender at cats. Um, and you know, it's just incredible. The people that you meet, the people that, you know, and then life goes on and you stick with totally. it and it's going and you watch each other grow and evolve and yes it's magical and also handle like some people breaking through before you and holding That's on right. to yourself and your own journey and going like all right I might have to sell merch a little longer but That's now right. I'm selling 100%. merch for my friend whose show who's on Broadway like it's That's it's right. tricky um so how did you make your Broadway debut like what was the breakthrough moment it it was Tommy and I love everyone was in that production. Like that was the most amazing group of people. Incredible thing. And I was yeah. a replacement. I went in about nine months after the opening. Okay. Who did you replace? I replaced Paul Doby, who the great Paul Doby. And I was so obsessed and I wanted to be in it so bad. And I went to every single open call and they would cut me after the dance call every time. So finally, Wayne Salento told Joyce Chittick, who was the dance captain, take him in the hallway and teach him how to do a double turn. If he can do a double turn, we can give him the job. And she wow. did. She wow. taught me to jump out of it as opposed to trying to like spin on the toe. Wait, but like in the hallway or like in the come hallway back in a couple of weeks? No, no, right then. In the hallway at 890. In my said, cowboy boots. Take him totally. 
take him outside and teach him how to do this. And she and you did could. It. And I did it. I, she taught me how to like jump out of it. And I just threw myself into it and I got the job. And that was my wow. first Broadway show. And it was okay. Awesome. So how did you find out? And what happens when you like, can you just take us through that moment? Yes. I'm on my I'm in my apartment with I think three or four roommates at the time on 53rd Street. And um the, my manager called me and it was like 9 30. And she said, I think you need to get up out of bed and sit up and take this in. And I said, okay, okay. And she said, you got Tommy. And I just, because I really had auditioned maybe 10 times, like over and over and over. Right. And um, it finally happened. <laughs> and I was and just. Did you stay with the show for a while? I did until it closed. Um, and I just loved every single minute of it. Every yeah. single. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just such an extraordinary show. Um, so now it's, now you're not selling merch for Tommy. Now you're no. in Tommy. That's right. That's true. And do you keep going on this like forward moving trajectory or are you doing Tommy and then back to a bartending job or doing Tommy well, or once that train leaves, are you able to just keep working? Yes, I was, but there were spells, of course, as we all know, of what's next. Oh God, we've hit nine months. What's next? We've hit, hit a year. What's next? But I was able to do um, television commercials, which were really helpful and really supported me. And they were, I probably did, <clears throat> I don't know, in my life, maybe 40. That's and a lot they were wonderful and they were great. And they started when I was a kid and then they probably went till I was, you know, I don't know, 30. Is there a trick? Like if you did a masterclass on booking commercials, um, do you feel like, oh yeah, I, I figured out at least for me, this is what I do and it you generally know, works. I'm trying to think if there is a trick. I would try to just coast in the room. I would not come in the room with a giant presence and like, hey, how are you? Great to see you. I would just try to like slip in, do the copy, fill it, but you know, do a TV version, don't do a stage version of it and then leave. I really just tried to like gracefully. So you were like mysterious auditioner. Trying, trying. And then they would say like, oh, can you, can you wear a specific outfit? And I would always just sort of wear what I wanted, just right. like. Um, so you didn't always follow the directions I in terms of what which, it said, like come in yes. in a you know turtleneck. You'd be like, hey. and that has followed me too. I mean, this is this is a story for later in my career, but it's the same. I, I don't know that the show a series of unfortunate events, which I was on, which was a dream. Amazing. The role was a hunchback. And David Rubin, legendary, iconic casting director, yes. said the thing, you can choose to come in as a hunchback. You can wear a hunch on your back. You can, you know, create a look. That's fine. Or right. whatever. Don't do it. So, or not. Right. I opted I'm just to imagining you driving down the 405 with like a well, big with hunchback. The hunchback. Well, the funny thing is, it was um, that casting office at the Grove, the farmer's market. Yes. Um, so I chose not to wear hunchback. I decided I stood in front of the mirror for like 30 minutes and just sort of like looked at my body and figured out, oh, how can I make this kind of look like I have a hunchback and not wear one. But I went into the audition room and into the waiting room. Four guys had hunchbacks on. Four guys. And I'm in a T-shirt and jeans. And I thought, well... That's it. Why didn't I put my throw pillow in my shirt? Why? Totally, if I had just done it. Yes. Um, and I really thought, I was like, wow, you really screwed this one up. You should have really. Worst feeling. It's the yeah, worst yeah. feeling. Yeah. But it worked out. It worked out. Um, I went when in. When you walked in the room, um, yeah. once you got in the room, I don't know if you were first, second, third, or fourth, if they'd yeah. seen yeah. three hunchbacks or where you were in the mix, but. Um, what do you comment on that? Or are you like, uh, this is my, this is me in a hunchback, but no, I'm such I a skinny mean. bitch. <laughs> hey, honey, you like my teacher. Um, no, I just went in and, um, Did I didn't scene. comment on it at all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, and then I like contorted my body the way, you know, that I thought I should. And <laughs> it 
it worked oh out. Oh my God, what a ridiculous life. It's such a ridiculous it life. An incredible, wild life of yes. all things. I know, but I just know that feeling when you're sitting in the room and you're like, why didn't I? Why didn't I? Or do? when you can hear all those years, like, especially like during pilot season and it's moving so fast and you're yeah. really like, I couldn't learn all the sides and everyone else seems so off book and you're I just know. like, like, I'm just going to go home and, and then I you know. get it or not like really, or not, but it, yes. it's really not about the hunchback at the end of it's the day. It's not at all at the end of the day. It, that is the lesson. Hashtag yes. it's not about the hunchback. <laughs> Listeners all over the land, if you yes. take one thing away from this, um, <laughs> it would be, I mean, I, I mean, we could do a whole episode on Rocky Horror. We could do a whole episode on The Lion King and sort of these really um, touchstone roles that you've had along the yeah. way. Yeah. But I, I feel like I would be remiss not spending a little bit of time because I do believe it opened doors for you in many ways, which is Hedwig. Like uh, just the beauty. I've known John Cameron Mitchell since he was sitting in a cafe with a little pad. And I was like, what are you working on? And he's like, I have this idea for this character, Hedwig. I mean, that's how early days, like pen, pad, and sort of describing it to me, this like, he's like, I don't know, it's just this crazy idea I have. And I want to try to, you know, when we were all beginning and thinking, oh, do we have to write something for ourselves? Sure. Oh, because God. how else are we going to be able to show people what we do? And that's what he came up with. And guess what? It was a really good idea. He changed the culture. Changed the culture. It's prophetic. Globally, like not just the, like, yeah. like, like a global culture shift. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, because it's your story, but I feel like whether it's myth or true, you were mm -hmm. in the Lion King when an opportunity for Hedwig is yeah. that right, or am I making that this is up? Absolutely, one hundred percent okay. correct. So and I love the, the story. Theater. Goes yes. Anytime I can go to the theater, I'm going to go. So on my sure. night, if something's playing, and I had heard about, I had met John at a voiceover audition, and I, of course, I had seen him in the Secret Garden and was obsessed. Yeah, with him. so beautiful. So I went to um, see this little show that had just started and people were talking about and I saw that was movie. it at the West Beth or at the Jane at the hotel do you remember like had, how early the days Jane. previews okay. at the Jane okay. um, and I went and I saw it and I thought oh I have to do this in some way and I called my agents and they said they called over they don't really see you as that and why would they I was like the nerdy crazy hyena and the Lion King why would they ever think that I would be able to do something like that so I went to, this is a crazy story. I don't know how, where I got the guts to do this, but I did it. So I went to Telsey's office with my headshot and I put a post-it note on the thing, on the picture. And, and I said, please see for Hedwig. And I just put it on the receptionist desk. And like ran out? Like and I left. Stealth yeah. walked I was in. stealth, okay. I slipped it in and I was gone. Like a, now. with like a hunchback. With a hunchback. <laughs> A hunchback in a dream. A paper happened. bag over your head. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I don't know if that's what did it or if they just decided, you know what, let's throw him a bone and bring him in. But I auditioned and I got it. And they were looking for someone to be the standby for John and to do one show a week for John. They did seven. They were trying to build the eighth in in a week. So I got it. And I they let me finish my Lion King contract out. And so I did the lot for my year. And then they let me come do um, Hedwig. And it was the most life-changing job experience in my life. Not only as an actor, it allowed sort of the world to see me do something I had never done before, but it allowed me to stand in my own shoes and be who I am in a very vocal technicolor way that I had never before um as a gay man so how did you know if you've never done it before mm -hmm. and I mean basically Wayne was like have him do the two spins and then we'll let him be in Tommy but it's not I mean I know that you were a physical actor obviously mm -hmm. you had some dance training you're you're comedic um but this is so out there right like in terms of not just being brave, 
like not just being brave as a performer, even if even if you were completely in touch in public about this part of your life, but like, right. how did you even know you could do it? I didn't. I didn't know, but I knew that I had to try and I knew that I wanted to. That score is so incredible. Those mono, the Tommy Gnosis monologue in the, in the trailer is so incredible. It, I just knew I had to do it. I had to try. And there were, I'm telling you, every performance before I went on stage in full regalia, I would think, I can't do it. I can't do it. How am I going to do it? Oh my God. Because, you know, it's like going, doing that role is, I would wake up, I felt like I'd been beaten up physically, yeah. emotionally. My voice was down here. The yeah. makeup made your face sting. Like It's a lot. But then you just, you get it together and you work with what you have that night this is what I have. This is what I have to give. And you discover um, ways to tell the story in a new, a new way. You know, it's in, this goes back to Lion King too, where we had the puppets, the hyena puppets, where we had crutches on our front arms and then cables that were attached to our heads, to our hyena heads. Incredible. And we would, Tracy Nicole Chapman, Stanley Wayne Mathis, and I would say, we feel limited in our expression like the way we can express ourselves physically the way we can express ourselves with our faces and julie would say well what you have to do is fill those limitations all the way to 150 percent and that will read in a way that if you were free and had all of this freedom that you could just you know do anything you wanted that will be even more powerful and she was right you know and so i've taken that lesson from her through my entire career that fill what you have to 150%. Yeah, yeah. Resonate. And and you ended up doing that part a lot, like in a lot of different places. Oh, and yeah. and, um, and, yeah. and then Rocky Horror, right? Like I feel yeah. like what, then, a, you know, that must have felt yeah. easy. <laughs> well, because I mean, there are other people you can talk to. Yes, <laughs> not, it's not by yourself. Although I remember with Hedwig, you know, what first seeing it at, at the Jane, it's like the audience, I, I could imagine how much that fed you. Like even oh. like once you were on stage, whatever you thought you didn't have, the ways in which they could yes. fill in those gaps for you because it was such a, it was such a communal yes. experience they, in that they way. They are a character in that piece. Yes. Yeah. And yes. John created it that way that you could do it in a, a bar, you could do it in a, church rec hall you could do wherever Hedwig could find a yeah. place to tell yeah. her story is no that's right I mean it could yeah. be really scrappy or or yeah. a lush Broadway production and I feel like I mean you know it makes sense to me if I'm casting glow and I'm looking for Bobby Bobby Barnes Bobby Barnes, yeah. Bobby Barnes yeah. that I'm gonna go like who could do that and and Kevin's one of those people I think oh like what a direct what a direct well, line to that. Jen Houston, casting director. Of, oh, I love Jen Houston. Oh, yeah. She's the best. She's the best. Was a, Had seen me in Hedwig and had come a number of, she loved the show and she had seen the show a number of times. And so that's how I got in the room for Glow was her as that's what wow. girl directors do. Remember. Right. Yeah. Oh, that and go was... see things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and go see, not just send their assistance out, but like yeah. actually go and see stuff. Yeah. Um I I uh I saw Shucked on I don't know what day it is anymore, but a few days ago I saw okay. Shucked. It okay. hasn't opened, but it will be open by the time this um this episode airs in the world. And I want to talk about because in reading about the history of this show, I believe you are one of the only people who has kind of been there since day one yes. um, through opening tomorrow night. And tomorrow night. I feel like it would be very cool to talk a little bit about what it is to really develop a brand new musical from day one through opening on Broadway and the joy, the pressure, Anything that kind of you would care to share as we, you know, you play Peanut, and I yeah. feel like in knowing you a little bit in real life and getting a little more deep dive, yeah, researching you for today, and now this conversation, again, it's like, wow, if there was ever a person whose 
life story would lead to being able to inhabit this role of Peanut in this musical Shucked. It's like tailor-made in terms of who yeah. you are in so many ways. So just what tell me about the show because it really is remarkable. I went to the show and other than seeing corn on a poster, <laughs> zero idea what right. I was about to see. Right. Yes. Well, it's the, I, I, I treasure this. I, it's been nine years that I've worked on this project. I read in the New York Post, Michael Riedel's column, that they were trying to make a musical of Hee Haw. And I thought, oh, hmm, this is a world I might be able to find my place in. Again, agents called over. They said, we're really looking for a different type for this role. I think they were looking for like a, a Bubba type guy, you know, like a country. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you walked into the casting office with your headshot and a little post-it that wrote, post see said, me for peanut. Whose name was Junior Junior at the time. It was exactly. not Peanut. So it was two post-its. That was junior, two Junior. Junior. <laughs> yeah, you flip the one post-it up and you see the other Junior. <laughs> um, but then I ran into my friend, Stephen Arimus, who at the time was involved. And he was like, they won't see you. Let me see if I can get you in. He got me in. I went in. I got the job, which of course was just a series of readings at the time, didn't have a production. And then we did a Dallas production, which um, was informative and important, but not right. Um, and then we went through years and years of trying to figure it out. They have, they replaced um, Brandy Clark, Shane McAnally and Robert Horn are the three writers. And they were steadfast about getting this show to finding its audience. And Brandy, Shane, Robert, and myself are the are the ones that have stayed with it this entire time. And there's been, you know, Jack O'Brien's on board now, Mike Bosner's the lead producer, and it finally found its way in the world. And there were so many times where I thought, well, this show's not gonna happen because there was a pandemic, yeah. you know, there was, you know, after Dallas, the reviews were not great. And, Will this show ever find its voice and its place? And it did. I, I really, it, yeah. Tell me as you have gone through eight years, which is like, by the way, not the the longest road for a show. Like, like, like when you really think about yeah. it, I mean, this is not abnormal. Right. Um, this is almost like a fast track compared to what other right. shows relationships well, to get into Broadway have been. But that's still, true. when you're in it day to day and obviously you, you know, you went off and did a lot of other really remarkable, beautiful performances oh, in the thanks. in the meantime. I have really been thinking a lot about this show. It was astonishing to me um, because I think most people came in it's sort of just been word of mouth. There's not a lot about it out there right now. And when I tell you the the amount of laughter to the point where you would sometimes miss the next line because yes. people are still like literally rolling in the aisles. And these are not drunken people. Like these were people who came right. to see a show sober. Right. They were literally like apoplectic. And yeah. I want to know, like, what is this show? Tell me what you think this show is. What does it want to do and be? What is the hope in terms of like, you know, on the first day, I always ask directors who come on the show, like, what do you say to your people on day one? Right. You're captain of the ship. What's yes. your dream for this voyage? What is the dream for the the aside from laughing so hard we're not kidding like that yes. alone right i mean yes. what else do you need you're giving people right. an outlet to be happy for two right. hours and 15 it's minutes wonderful that yeah. alone like we'll take it but i'm really curious like what is what is it it's a show that says we are stronger together in this divisive world where we're all on our phones and we're all on our devices you are coming into a show that you know nothing about probably people on stage that you know nothing about. Probably if you met these people in real life, you would think you would not want anything. You know, they're just, they're, 
it's about it's south of north and north of south. That's what it says in the text as where we're located. And it's I've had so many people at the stage door say, I'm from Iowa. I'm from Nebraska. I'm from Ohio. This is the first time I've ever seen a musical where it felt like I was watching my friends and it was my voice, it, which is very interesting because it also has a very, very inclusive message about diversity, loving each other, accepting each other. The heart is so bright and yellow in this show that you, even when you walk down 41st street, like the marquees and the, it's, it's so bright. And I think everyone feels welcome. I think everyone sees themselves in the show. It's those three writers are geniuses and they have tapped into something so pure and so common and Jack has guided it in such a beautiful way. And what could be, you know, just a corny kind of country show, he has gracefully just taken his paintbrush and everything is just, I did a lot of research when I was figuring out who Peanut was with these old country comedians like Minnie Pearl and Jerry Clower and these comedians who <clears throat> at the time, you know, this is black and white TV with, you know, and radio, really, Minnie Pearl started on radio. They were a comedic voice for people who'd never had anyone represent them. This was, a, this, they were a conduit to reach a certain number of people to say, oh, I know your everyday thoughts and feelings. I know what you're going through. And it's simple humor. It's simple. There is nothing <laughs> cerebral about it. I mean, it's smart. You have to think about it, but it's about my character Peanut is like, you know, if you can fit your dog in one hand, you own a cat. It's that kind of. Okay, <laughs> by the way, you have, I mean, I, I do not have script in hand, but let's say you have a thousand one-liners. Um, a, you know, I was thinking I was recently offered a, a play, a Moliere play, which is rhyming oh. couplet. And I'm like, okay, but if I go up, how do I, I, how, I can't solve the problem, right? right. Like, unless right. I'm like, you know, Lynn manuel and can come up with a rhyme in two seconds. It's just as good totally. as Moliere's, which I'm not. So have you ever? I don't know. I don't know. You I might be. Might. You might I be. I might. <laughs> Alana Manuel Miranda. Um, <laughs> what, what have you had to do to, I mean, maybe you never go up. Maybe you're an actor who never fumfers, as my mother wood. says. You can't see me, but you can hear that. That's me. Like, have you have you been able to land them every time without well, sort of because it's mean, the um, gentlest mistake and the whole thing is like er, that didn't land. Yes, and if you take a breath, if you take a breath in the wrong spot, you're out. Of luck. You're out. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. It is so just, you know that now, eight years later, if you've learned yes. one thing, where to breathe. Well, and New York audiences are different too. They laugh different than a Salt Lake City audience. Huh. They laugh. Like, what do you mean by that? Like how, like where, and like what tickles them? Yes. What tickles them? When we were in Salt Lake City in the fall with the show, you know, there's very blue humor in the show and salacious ideas. And you would sense that audience clutch their pearls and go. <laughs> <laughs> laughing on the inside. <laughs> yes. As opposed to New York where there's uproarious. Oh, they're dying. Like, they're just dying. They're dying. They're yeah. dying. Is that the greatest um, feeling ever? There's nothing better. There are you just nothing. like, are you just high from this show? Yes. I can't go to sleep till like 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Incredible. No, I can only imagine. But there is, you know, every time I go on. So I have a series, if you haven't seen a show, of I think jokes. And they are not connected to the story. They're not connected to the plot. And they happen every time I come on stage. Mm -hmm. Robert Horn, genius, brilliant, singular will switch those out. He'll be like, hey, let's take that middle one out tonight and put this one in, or let's try this one, let's see. So you're still working material. We were until about two days ago. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I would be, I would before I'd go on stage, I would say, I would write them down. Okay, so this scene we are doing pretzel, pretzel, toilet seat, bullet. Like I would give my, and right before I go on stage, I'm like pretzel, toilet seat, bullet, go. Like I would refresh in my mind. Um, and maybe it's on your hand. <laughs> and maybe it's on my hand, right. It's on the back of a piece of corn. <laughs> yeah. Thank God there's a lot of corn on that stage. But there's also, isn't there though? 
Uh I mean, that gorgeous set that Scott passed in. Um, Yes. Yes. By the way, you walk in again, not knowing a thing about it. You're like, this is stunningly beautiful. It's like part Oklahoma set, part Dwell Mm -hmm. magazine. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I would live in that barn, but also, oh, what a beautiful morning. Like it's very... And then you're like, Very oh, wait, it's all falling down. So is this Barry child? Like, and now, what, exactly, exactly. But, and the lighting, who is your lighting designer? Daphne Weidman, who's a genius. It's just so beautiful. I mean, it really is like lush and beautiful and yes. Broadway in all those ways. And at like an old barn. It's one set. You would but think, it's really but pretty. It's so much. And Tilly Grimes yeah. the costumes and yeah. the sound. And it's just incredible. And your hump is so good. Be like my hump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing that to opening night too, to bar night. No, my dad's belt and <laughs> the hump from the guy at the audition for yes. Lemony Snicket who didn't get it. Um, wait, wait. Okay, so you have new lines still until two nights ago. Yes. And you would, you somehow, have there been any mishaps yet? Not, clearly not you and not your landing a joke. Any well, funny I- backstage um any on stage well you, we do a crazy number in act two that is very athletic that is all barrels and boards and it is kind of like the circus yes. like you know we're jumping especially andrew duran how brilliant is andrew duran in the show i mean yeah. he's jumping on boards on barrels yeah and sort of surfing across. i mean sadly he's very unattractive so luckily yes. it's a shame you have to look at him for two i mean hours. Thank God he can also dance. That's all yeah, I can God. say. And he sings Jesus. like nobody else. It's, it's he, so stupid. He's, hard, he's, he's No, he's, I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed. In fact, I'm not having him on this podcast because he's too <laughs> it's pretty. Too how, how would and I do he's it? He's the nicest, yeah. kindest human being, and I get to share a dressing room with him. So I don't know how. Oh, I, that's so I great. found my, you know, lucky stars. Yes, you guys love anyway, each other. There are, there are mishaps in that barrel number because it's like circus and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but and poor andrew broke his wrist in salt lake city doing that number like that's how sort of like well the plank that he has to i mean there's there's again it, you know no one's gonna yeah. it, i can't go on and on because it's a podcast and no one knows what we're talking about right. needless to say it, it is, is super thrilling. complicated and yes. thrilling yeah yeah um, so that would be sort of the only mishap, but, um, you know, it's every night you feel like you're walking a tightrope in the most wonderful way, you know, and Are Alex the, Newell, come on, Alex Newell, that song independently owned, which Brandy yeah. Jane wrote for Alex is going to become one of the great Broadway yeah. standards. Everyone's yes. going to have it in their audition book. Yeah. They're going to do it in every cabaret, every concert. Um, every drag show, like it's just the most fantastic. And Alex's performance, the standing ovation, every yeah. show in the middle. Like of within 10 minutes. I mean, I feel like it's very early on and it's yeah. thrilling. Um, I cannot believe I'm talking to you on the eve before opening <laughs> of the show. How, how do you feel? I feel um, so full of emotion and gratitude. Gra- that's it. I am so grateful that I'm an actor. I'm so grateful that I'm an actor in New York City. I'm so grateful that I'm an actor in a Broadway show, in a brand new original musical that I get to sort of give the first stab at, peanut at. And I'm so, the, and I say this all the time, if nothing happened with Shupt, at least I walked away with friendships with Robert, Brandy and Shane, for over the past eight years, yeah. who have become my nearest and dearest, most wonderful friends. And now with Andrew Durand and all of this, it's all about the people. That's what it's all about. Like mm-hmm. who you take with you at the end of the day. And, you know, who, who it like what started at the beginning saying like all of your friends that you come up with and that you travel through this show business life with that is so yeah inconsistent and peaks and valleys and heartbreak and triumph it just it's all about the people and it's all about the people well before i let you go is there a little known fact about you that you can share a little known fact Mm -hmm. like a a good fun secret fact Um, um um oh this is so good 
this is probably known, but there really is no place I'd rather be than the theater. Watching a show, sitting in the audience, having the good fortune to be in a show. Um, I mean, even walking by theater gives me a thrill. Like it's just, it's, I, it's just, I love it more than anything. Kevin Cahoon, thank you for being on the podcast today. I'm so honored. I cannot thank you enough. This was the best 48 minutes of the, of the week so far. Thank you. Well, I hope the next 48 are equally glorious and thank you. break a leg tomorrow night. And thank you um, so much. I cannot wait to give you a hug in person. That's I can't wait. I feel. Let's All make right. it happen. Okay. Mwah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.